Okay, welcome to a brief explanation of the underlying principles behind the recrystallization process and exactly how that works uh, to provide us with relatively high purity samples of organic crystalline materials. And we're going to start this discussion with a question. And the question is, how do intermolecular forces drive the recrystallization process? How is it that these uh, intermolecular forces are, are on our side, as it were, when we're attempting to purify an organic crystalline material. And to do this, we're going to have to have a cast of characters, uh, one of which will be molecules of the product of interest, and we'll be depicting those as green squares. And for the time being, we'll be thinking of impurity as a different type of shape. In this case, molecules of impurity will be depicted in these, some of these cartoon illustrations as red triangles. So let's take a look at how we can begin to understand the process of recrystallization using these very simple analogs for organic compounds. In example one, we're going to recrystallize a compound which is already pure so that we can start thinking about the thermodynamics of this transition and, and the state changes that'll be taking place. So let's take a look at that. Here we have our sample on the right hand side of a highly pure, highly ordered crystalline material consisting only of the compound of interest. What we're going to do is look at the left hand side which is an energy coordinate diagram showing how the energy, the free energy of the system changes as we dissolve and then recrystallize this already pure material. Our location on the diagram will be represented by the small red and white bullseye that you see at the left hand side of the energy diagram trace. Now, let's begin by disassembling this crystal uh, all the way down to the molecular level. We want each molecule solvent separated. And to do that, we need to put some energy into the system because we're trying to reach a higher free energy state that is dissolved. So let's do that now. We'll add heat to dissolve the sample. And in doing so, this undissolved crystal will have to be pulled apart molecule by molecule, meaning we have to overcome all the intermolecular forces holding these well-ordered uh, set of molecules together. As we apply our heat and dissolve the sample, it becomes solvent separated. But we've increased the free energy of the system. And if we were to cool the system slowly, what we would find is that it would uh, reconfigure itself into its lower energy state. And because all we have are molecules of our desired compound, the result is obvious. We're going to go right back to the state that we were in originally which is to say that if we cool just a sample, we expect it to go back to essentially the same state. Here we have again a highly ordered crystal where all of the intermolecular forces are maximized because this regular repeating crystal structure is set up to give us the best, strongest interactions when we're dealing with a series of molecules of the same type. Let's take a look at how we can use this behavior of crystalline materials to purify an impure sample of an organic crystalline solid. So now what we're going to do is dissolve an impure sample and then we're going to recrystallize it with slow cooling to ensure that we get the purest possible product. So here's our new system. Notice that in this new system we have a sample which has an impurity and that the impurity doesn't fit as well into the crystal lattice. This means that some of those intermolecular forces around this local impurity are compromised. They're weaker. And because of this, the free energy of the impure crystal is higher than the free energy of the pure crystal. So if we can disassemble this crystal down to the molecular level and then allow it to reform under conditions favoring the most stable state, we expect a crystal of higher purity to result. So let's do that now. So we heat our sample, it dissolves, the molecules become solvent separated. Now as we slowly cool the sample, molecules will begin to form a new crystal. At the surface of this growing crystal, new molecules will come in and stick. And this is the process of crystal growth. But what you'll notice in this illustration is as I animate it, the impurity doesn't stick very well and is able to fall off of the face of the crystal going back into solution again. And this allows for a very pure crystal to form. So here our impurity doesn't interact as strongly with the surface. 
so it's able to fall off, making room for new molecules of the desired kind to form stronger interactions in the crystal. And because of this, we've gone energetically downhill. So cooling slowly is important because that places thermodynamics in charge of the system and guarantees that we'll reach the most stable free energy state possible. And in our case, that's a pure crystal. Now I'd like to illustrate for you why it is so important that we cool recrystallization samples very slowly. And let's do that by considering what would happen if we were to cool a solution very rapidly from which we were attempting to recrystallize a pure material. In this example, just as before, we're going to heat our sample to dissolve the impure crystal in our chosen solvent. When we do this just as before, our sample will dissolve, reaching a higher energy state. Now this time we're going to cool our sample, but we're going to do so rapidly. And we're going to cool it so rapidly that thermodynamics is removed from the equation. So now the fact that these pure crystals are more stable than impure crystals is not going to be the driving force in the state that we reach at the end of the process. So let's cool rapidly and see. Notice that as we cool this mixture rapidly, impurities which might otherwise fall off the face and not be entombed in the crystal are instead trapped because the face is growing so rapidly that new molecules of the desired compound come in and essentially encapsulate it at the surface. The result of this is an impure crystal, and this is not the goal of recrystallization. Therefore, slow cooling is essential during the recrystallization process because it keeps thermodynamics in charge, favors the formation of pure, high-quality crystals, which we can use then for either further experimentation or identification by melting point which will be the topic of our next segment.